Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. So glad you have joined us this morning. This is Memorial Day weekend, believe it or not. It's creeped up on us so quickly. Uh, we hope that you have a good weekend and we'll have a special prayer during our prayer time at the end, um, praying for those who uh, families who have lost loved ones as a result of um, current wars. But just we want to remember those who have died in our service to serve and to help America be free. So we're thankful for the many men and women who served in that way. Also, we want to know if you are new to uh, us online, if you have questions for us, or you want information more about us, we have a connect form that will be posted on our Facebook Live. Also, if you have a prayer request or you have questions for us, please fill out that form. We'll get back with you. We'll respond to you as, as quickly as, as we can. Also want to highlight one of our new Bible studies that are going to be happening on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. It's on uh, questions, hard questions about Christianity, about God. And the first one we're tackling is uh, why does God allow suffering, especially in light of the COVID pandemic? And how, where, where does God come to play and all that? If, if you're wanting to know more about that, if you're, your heart is searching for those kind of answers, or if you want to be pre better prepared to answer some of those questions, please come to the study 7 o'clock on Zoom. And it's on our private Facebook page if you're interested in that as well. And um, we would love to give that information to you. Give, fill out that connect form. Now we have a special uh, time where we are installing uh, our, our, and ordaining our Director of Children and Family Ministries, Jamie Swope, as an elder, but also commissioner as a commission late pastor. So enjoy this next segment as we continue uh, to worship our God this morning. Today, we have a great privilege of both uh, installing Jamie Swope, our Director of Children's Ministry and Families Ministry, not only to our elder, uh, as an ordained elder serving Nielsville, but also as commissioned lay pastor. And she's done a lot of work, and I'll say a little bit more later, but I wanted to ask Brian just to explain what the commissioned lay pastor part um, she has been through these last two years. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, just brief description. Commission Lay Pastor is a relatively new program of the eco denomination. It's created less than two years ago, and it's described in our constitution. And so far, there have only been about 50 people go through it. I think there's another 50 currently in process. Um, so, what's it about? Um, like any Presbyterian denomination, eco places a high value on education and training, but eco has a new twist to that, a new dimension. It's not just pastors that we need to train, but also lay people, especially church leaders or potential leaders who should want to grow by discipline study. So these kinds of programs are an effort to shift the culture away from having the clergy and the staff do all the work that Christ calls us to do, but empowering and unleashing the laity to do it, which gets back to the biblical vision of the priesthood of all believers. So Jamie has gone through a 10-month process, it includes video lectures online, homework assignments, participation with the group from around the country. It has a facilitator and a mentor at the local church. A big part of it is training around 10 core competencies. And so the program is for lay leaders who feel called and gifted to administer the sacraments and to step in the role of lay pastor serving under the authority of the senior pastor of the church especially in small groups or in micro expressions of church. It's really, it's a wonderful new program and we're very excited about it. Thank you. Michelle, Mel Michelle Kelly has been her mentor this past year and so she has a few words to say. Just, uh, just a little more than a year ago, Jamie invited me to be her mentor and encourager for this remarkable uh, CLP certified late pastor program that ECO has developed, uh, which Brian just told you about. It's a very impressive plan and one which was very well suited for Jamie at this point in her faith journey. All of you already know Jamie is a talented and vibrant Christian woman who manages our children and family ministry with enthusiasm and skill and a desire to lead children and families to Christ. And you've seen her communication skills as she makes announcements and gives a friendly welcome to people in our worship services. And you have been warmed by her beautiful smile as she does children's sermons. You've also heard her preach. You might have been one of the people blessed by her joy and ability in mentoring and discipling individuals in their faith walk. You might not know that um, ever since she was a teenager, she has felt a calling to attend seminary and prepare for pastoral ministry. 
So the CLP program was a great opportunity for her to take a step forward in exploring the sense of calling that she's had. Uh, the program is designed to equip church leaders in general, grow in their faith and abilities to strengthen their congregations, but it's also been an excellent aid to her as she uh, works with our children and families and helps them flourish at Nielsville. Um, I've learned that Jamie drinks in learning the way fresh cut flowers take up water. She has a keen intellect and like a tree planted by the stream in Psalm 1, she thrives, soaking up the living water of scripture and solid theological instruction. She has a deep desire to study in order to grow in grace and, and an ability to serve. She has a godly ambition. And she truly wants to be a worker approved by God, as Paul encouraged Timothy to be. We had some wonderful times of prayer and discussions about the things she was learning, about discerning the future path God has for her, about our congregation and its mission and ministry. And Jamie did an immense amount of work in 10 months, reading and studying and writing papers. It has been a blessing to travel this path with her. It was a great experience to see how her fellow CLP students and course leaders could see God's hand on her and confirm her sense of call to ministry. I'm really fortunate to have Jamie as a friend, and we are all very fortunate to have her on our staff. It will be a great joy to see what God has in mind for her as she continues to study and grow. So, Jamie, congratulations on your completion of this rigorous CLP program, and may God continue to richly bless you and your family. Yeah. Well, good. That leaves me a few minutes to speak. <laughs> I have a, I have a three, part, three part message like I always do, right? So, Jamie, uh, three things that I have appreciated about you in these last two years that I've come to know you is your love for God, your love for the church, and the love for your family. And in all three of those, you really see your passion. First, your love for God. You want to serve him with your whole heart. And part of that is understanding who he is and your heart for theology and your heart for reformed theology, which I appreciate. And so it's been a great joy to see you grow this past year in the, in the core, in the training uh, in that. Secondly, your love for, for the church. You have a heart for the church. You want the church, this church, Nielsville to excel, to, to grow in the grace of Christ. And it's been a blessing to serve with you, to hold me accountable, to make sure that I'm keeping that focus as well, keeping the main thing, the main thing, as we often talk about, and that is the gospel. And so I appreciate that partnership um, to serve with you in ministry and look forward to, to years ahead. Third is your love for your family. That is a huge priority. Your love for your husband, your love for your children is priceless and a, is a blessing. And just their love for you and their support for you and their encouragement to you is 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 an encouragement yeah the big thumbs up we got it <laughs> your son your brother your your son your husband just said that so anyway so i'm i'm excited about this new um not only you becoming an elder but uh, um you becoming the commission lay pastor it's going to be a a blessing to you and it's going to be a blessing to our church and we look forward to um serving with you Thank with that you. in mind um the part of the commissioning service at wants us to ask these questions. So we're, we're combining both her ordination as a ruling elder, or elder, sorry, we don't use ruling elder anymore, do we? And um, the commission lay pastor with these questions. So each of the elders are gonna be asking you a question. Um, and so we ask you to ask this in affirmative, these finally ordination vows for you to be commissioned as a lay pastor, but also as, a, uh, as an elder to serve at uh, Nielsville Presbyterian Church. Kevin, you have the first question. Jamie, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you boldly declare Jesus Christ as Lord and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? I do. Darth. Um, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God and inspired by the Holy Spirit? the unique witness of Jesus Christ and the authority for Christian faith and life? I do. Uh, Jamie, will you receive, adopt, and be bound by the essential tenets of ECO as a reliable exposition of what scripture teaches us to do and to believe? And will you be guided by them in your life and ministry? I will. Jamie, relying on the Holy Spirit, 
Do you humbly submit to God's call on your life, committing yourself to God's mission and fulfilling your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and guided by our confession? I will. Jamie, will you be governed by Eco's polity and rules of discipline? I will. And Jamie, will you be accountable to your fellow elders, deacons, and pastor as you lead? I will. Jamie, do you promise to be faithful and maintain the truth of the gospel and the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Jamie, will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? I will. Jamie, will you faithfully shepherd the flock that God has given to you by proclaiming the good news, teaching the faith, showing the people God's mission, caring for them, and partnering to help raise up new leaders in the body of Christ? I will. Jamie, we will now all extend our arms and our hands as I lead us in prayer. Kevin, Madeline, Charlotte, and Jason, please lay your hands upon Jamie as well. Let us pray. Father God, we bow before you tonight to thank you with grateful hearts for your faithful and precious servant, Jamie. As she has promised to be accountable and faithful, to pray, serve, and shepherd, we know you will be faithful to her, Lord. Uplift and sustain her by your spirit and love. Be with her husband, Kevin, their th three children, Madeline, Charlotte, and Jason, as they support Jamie in this calling to serve you, Lord, and the church. Provide Jamie with an endless reserve of energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. It is in the name of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we come before you humbly to ask all these things. Amen. 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 So part of her being a commissioned lay pastor at the end of this service, she'll be uh, sharing with us a benediction. So thank you. Congratulations, Jamie. Thank, thank you, you. Sort of family for being here. Yeah. Yay. Clap. Congratulations. All right. God bless. All right. Good morning, Nielsville. We are so excited to be worshiping together with you today. Let us lift our voices together in the call to worship taken from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us continue to worship as we lift our voices in song, singing in Christ alone. Good morning, Nielsville. Let's worship together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I ground his body lay 
light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen Oh Lord, you are enough In this busy season, Lord, help these words of the song remind us that it is in Christ alone that we find our hope and our strength. Lord, as we come before you in worship, let us set aside all of those other weights and burdens that we carry. Lord, let us put them before you and just lift our voices in praise and worship. Lord, you are, again, you are enough. You are holy. You are just. You are with us even when everything in our universe is changing. You are constant. And Lord, we just, we praise the one who has and will forever be. Lord, encourage our hearts, comfort us as we continue in our worship. Amen. Let's continue worshiping.
please join me now in this time of confession as we will confess together and then followed by a time of quiet reflection. O Lord, our God, who brought his people out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and by Christ delivered us from sin, you have been faithful to keep all the promises of your covenant. But we, O Lord, have been stiff-necked people who love unfaithfulness, who have loved other gods before you and become their servants. We have not worshipped you in spirit and in truth, and so we have mocked your glory in heaven. We have used your name in vain and profaned your reputation on earth. We have desecrated your Sabbath because we have not trusted you to give us rest. We have not honored our fathers and mothers, and so we have proved ourselves rebels. We have hated our neighbors and murdered them in our hearts. We have made adulterers of ourselves in lust of our eyes or in the deeds of our flesh. We have stolen honor and wealth and privileges that are not ours. We have lied and falsely accused, for we love gossip more than truth. We have coveted blessings you wisely and righteously gave to others. O Lord, have mercy on us, for we have not kept your law. And now for our assurance of pardon, where we are assured that we know that in our own flesh, there's no way we can continuously uphold the law. But as is found in Galatians 2, 19 through 21, for through the law, I died to law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Friends, let us find freedom in this gift that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us continue in our worship together as we confess what we believe as taken from the Westminster Confession, chapter 8.6, Christ the Mediator. Although the work of redemption was not actually done by Christ until after his incarnation, yet the power, effectiveness, and benefits of it were given to the elect in all ages from the beginning of the world by means of those promises, types, and sacrifices which reveal him and indicated that he would be the seed of the woman, would bruise the serpent's head, and was the lamb slain from the beginning of the world. Jesus Christ is yesterday and today and forever the same. We're now going to invite our children to be sure that they are joined in worship with us. Uh, Miss Melissa Evans is going to lead our children in a time of thanksgiving and worship. Hi, Nailsville kids. All right, I am going to hop up on my deck and down there, there's a two inch wide piece of tape that is going to be my tightrope. And then I'm gonna hop back down and tell you about today's lesson. All right, here I go. scary. Okay. Imagine I was only up there for like, I don't know, three seconds and I could jump back down three and a half feet back to my deck. I want to tell you a story that I heard and I researched it and it's true. There is a gentleman named Charles Blodin, B-L-O-D-I-N. You can look it up later. Not right now. He walked on a two inch tightrope across Niagara Falls. He had a tightrope stretched from Canada to the United States, Niagara Falls, and he walked across it multiple times. Not just once, multiple times. But the time I want you guys to learn about is the time that he took his manager on his back. So get this, Charles, a professional tightrope walker, takes another person and carries him on his back. Crazy, I know. Let's just give you the example. As his manager, it would not have been 
smart or a good idea for him to stop halfway and say, you know what, Charles? I've watched you do this a hundred times. I got this. I'm going to take it from here. You did a good job of carrying me halfway, but I really feel certain I can do the rest of the journey by myself. Uh, not a good idea. Well, I want you guys to think about that in terms of your faith journey. So, Jesus does not expect you to do everything on your own. In fact, he wants you to be with him the entire time. Allow Jesus to carry you the entire way of your life. Always allow that because that's what faith is. It is not that you think, you know, I, I think I know enough on my own now and I'm good and I can do this. It's trusting that God has what's best for you and will keep you safe from beginning to end. Now, one last little fact that I learned while I was learning about this guy was that he walked across the Niagara Falls wearing bright pink pants. I didn't have pink pants, but that's why I'm wearing a pink shirt for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Don't forget, it is all about the faith in Jesus Christ and that relationship. And that is what we want you guys to learn today. Thank you, Melissa. And now we come to part of our service, which is our tithes and offering, and we encourage you all to consider um, how you have been generously blessed and, and opportunities for which you can bring your offering, whether it's in your gifts or your talents, um, and a reminder that there are still many ways in which you can provide those donations to the church. You can text, you can mail those in, or you can go on our wells, website at neilsville.org. So now let us um, continue to worship in music that we have Adenda who is going to be singing for us. And again, just prayerfully consider how the Lord may be asking you to give of your gifts and talents during this season. Yeah. 
I hope you were moved by that rendition of that song as I have, I was. Thank you, Adinda and Dion for putting it all together and for Jonathan and Lori and Brian and Brian and Sue for joining them in that act of worship. It was beautiful. Thank you, Tamara, for your heartfelt leading us in worship and Jonathan as you led us in song and Melissa for your fantastic um, message that hits right home on what we're talking about uh, this morning. Uh, just recently, I had a recent conversation uh, with someone, and he said something to me like this. He said, Jeff, you know, you are all about justification by faith. And as I heard that, I said, of course, yes, amen, I bet, uh, you betcha I am. Why? Because the all of Scripture, especially this passage in Paul, from Paul in his letter to Galatians, is all about this justification by faith, by living by faith alone. Now, many of you may be saying, uncle, uncle, we've heard enough, but nope, we're going to continue down this path, making certain that we understand and grasp the amazing grace of the gospel. Faith in Christ, as expressed in the free grace of the gospel, is needed when we first trust Jesus, as Melissa was reminding the children, as long, but as long as we grow in our faith. Tim Keller says this, we are not only saved by the gospel, but we also now grow by the gospel. Paul is saying that we don't begin by faith and then proceed and grow through our works. We are not only justified by faith in Christ, we are also sanctified by faith in Christ. We never leave the gospel behind. As you begin your life by faith in Christ, you continue your life by faith in Christ. Our faith is, is not just getting into the front door. As many of you know, we are looking for a new home and we have gone through a lot of front doors, but not only do we go into the front doors, we go into the office, the, the, the foyer, the, the dining room, the living room, the family room, the kitchen, the bedrooms, the bathroom, right? That's what our faith is. It's going not only through the front door, but we go through the living room, we go through the kitchen, we go through the bedrooms, we go through the bathroom. You see, the gospel is, is what we need when we first believe and the gospel is needed when we grow our faith. The gospel is needed for all of life. So we turn to this, our attention to Galatians chapter 3, and we learn more about living by faith alone in Christ. And, and now Paul is directly talking to the Christians of, this, of these churches in Galatia. And he's concerned for them to so hear what he says. Galatians 3 verses 1 through 14. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? 
Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed if it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Know that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified by God before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every, anyone, everyone, anyone who is hung on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that might, we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Let's pray. Father, again, we're reminded of the beautiful truths of your work in our lives and faith, that we're justified by faith, and we continue to need that faith in Christ in our journey. So Lord, use this time together this morning. Convict us, change us, mold us, help us never to lose sight of our need of you 24 7. Lord, we need you from the beginning of that tightrope to the end of that tightrope. God, help us to see that in this text this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been bewitched? Or have you seen someone bewitched? Or let me say it more in the vernacular have you ever seen someone spellbound or maybe tricked? Has someone influenced you? To the point that you you are led to do something or believe something that was contrary to who you are or you've seen someone who you've seen someone experience that for many of us who have children right we have taught them so well and then they begin to do things that are contrary to what we taught them we think oh man they're, they're bewitched what's going on right well the church at galatia was they were bewitched and paul was very upset in fact paul was indignant and rightly so. Why the church was in danger of nullifying the free grace of God. Remember the Judaizers, as we talked about a few weeks ago, as we continue to learn about how they're trying to, what they're doing, they're, they had come from Jerusalem to persuade the Christians that the works of the law was necessary for them to be right with God, to be acceptable with God, to be justified. They needed to follow the law. And we saw last week, if that was true, then Christ died for no purpose. Why would someone else have to die for my sins if I could take care of it myself? So with this in mind, Paul's outburst becomes completely understandable. John Calvin reminds, for when we hear that the Son of God, with all his blessings, is rejected, and that his death is esteemed as nothing, what godly mind will not break out into indignation? So as Paul saw the Galatians beginning to follow the way of the Judaizers, they, he, they, they were acting foolishly. And so he expected that some of them were under kind of witchcraft, that he says, who bewitched you? In fact, the Greek word means here to give someone, which means someone the evil eye, to cast a spell, to over to fascinate of holding someone spellbound by an irresistible power. In fact, Philip Reichen in his commentary says that it was as if a sorcerer had, had cast an evil spell on them, or if as a magician had them under his hypnotic influence. Let me be clear. Paul knew that the Galatians were not really bewitched in that way, in that particular way. They were under the influence of false teachers who wanted to cheapen the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who wanted to add the law of Moses to faith in Christ to produce a faith, a Jesus plus gospel. So to get their attention, to get our attention, Paul uses language to suggest that some there was some demonic influence at work. 
Again, Reichen says, one of the devil's favorite strategies, strategy, strategies is to distort the truth so that people can no longer tell the difference between, between the one true gospel and the false alternatives. See, what we learn from Paul's language and interaction with the Galatians here is that doctrinal error has two primary sources, too many, too many, two primary sources, human ignorance and demonic malevolence. The Galatians were so foolish to abandon the free grace of the gospel, but they were doing so because they were under spiritual attack. Now, not everything, every reason, for every reason we, not all the time when we're foolish, it is because Satan is behind it. But sometimes Satan is behind our foolishness. But an example of one that maybe is not influenced is this. During World War II, a group of ministers uh, meant to discuss why the church failed to stand up against the evils of Hitler in the Third Reich. Some, some of them tried to justify their actions by appealing to the demonic forces that led them astray. But one brave minister took courage and challenged these men and said, gentlemen, we have all been very foolish. Friends, we too can become foolish if we try to add anything to the gospel, anything to the amazing, beautiful truth of grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. So what else does Paul want the church and us to understand about this gospel, this free grace of the gospel, so that we may, that we do keep the main thing, the main thing. So other aspects we will see in this, in this particular, these particular verses is of living by faith alone is it is first of all empowered by the spirit. It's tied to the past. And then we're gonna look at this curse removed. Look at verses one to five, it is empowered by the spirit. Now next week is Pentecost Sunday. So this week we're gonna have a, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, too bad it didn't schedule properly, but hey, it's important to follow this text and we're empowered by the Spirit. Paul mentions the Spirit three times in verses two through five. So this should get our attention and understand that the, the Spirit's role in our faith journey, the Spirit's role in our union with Christ. And these verses, in fact, Paul appeals to four spiritual experiences of the spirit. This is from uh, the commentary from Reich and his health. The first spiritual experience that Paul mentions is in verse two, the question about initiation. See, Paul took the Christians back to the moment of their conversion when he says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? First experience, one of initiation, one of conversion. The second experience it was one of completion look at verse three the complex the question about completion how, or how the christian makes it to the end of the christian life he says this having begun by the spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh the third experience he mentions and then verse four it's a question about persecution the cost of following the crucified christ did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain and the last spiritual experience is one in verse five is a question about miracles and their meaning for the Christian life. And so he asks, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, Feld Reichen summarized all these questions boil down to a single issue. And this is it. Does the Christian obtain the spirit by working the law or by hearing by faith? Now, the question was meant to be rhetorical, for the Galatians Christians could not possibly deny that their experience with the Holy Spirit. Paul assumed if, if they were Christians at all, they received the Holy Spirit when they came to faith in Jesus Christ. Throughout Paul's letter to this church, he inter interweaves the triune God. In fact, all most of his letters, he does this. There's one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity is involved in our salvation from beginning to end, in, in when, of us coming to faith in Christ from the beginning to the end. The Father has authored salvation. Christ has accomplished salvation, and the Spirit applies salvation. The Father authors salvation. Christ 
accomplished, the Son accomplishes the salvation, and the Spirit applies our salvation. So Paul brings the Christian attention to the work of the Spirit in applying our salvation. See, so it's, a, it's the Galatians knew something about this saving work. See, first they come to understand his re regeneration influence. Second, they receive the gifts such as teaching and prophecy. Then later on, we see in Galatians that they display the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, and all the rest. We see the Holy Spirit worked miracles among them, as he often does when the gospel first penetrates a culture or a nation. The apostles cast out demons. They healed the sick. They have seen the Holy Spirit work among them and their community at large. So Paul challenges the Galatians to know how did they receive the Spirit? Is it by the works of the law, or was it by hearing by faith? So it can go something like this. If, if one gets the Spirit by working the law, then there's something I must do to get the Spirit. I have to keep the Torah. I have to follow the regulations of, of the Old Testament law. And if that's true, then, then, I get, then that's when I get the Spirit. Then for the, therefore, the blessing of the Spirit is God's reward for my spiritual achievement. And if we're honest and left to ourselves, we want that. We want some method that will guarantee a healthy spiritual experience. Show us where the bar of obedience is so we can get it. But friends, God is not a mechanism. The only way to enter a relationship with God is by faith alone, trusting Christ and his work alone. And it's the dwelling presence of the Spirit that helps us to come by faith to acknowledge that he empowers us to believe and to help with our belief throughout our walk with him. But not only does the Spirit enable us to trust Christ, the Holy Spirit precedes our faith. The Spirit's working even before we come to faith, for the Spirit is the one who enables a sinner like you and I to actually believe. He helps us to see. He helps us to see our sin and our need of a Savior. He helps us to see that Jesus is that Savior who meets all the requirements that we need to be saved. See, Paul wants them to understand that you do absolutely nothing to get the Holy Spirit. He wants us to understand that as well. They received the Spirit long before the Judaizers have came to tell them to keep the law. They were doing just fine without them being told to keep the law. See, they received the Holy Spirit's indwelling when they trusted in what Jesus had done for them on the cross and through the resurrection. We receive the Holy Spirit when we come to faith in Christ. So as Paul reminds them, and as he reminds us, they and we, and we receive the Spirit by believing what they heard, namely the law-free gospel of the crucified, risen Christ. For Christians, hearing is believing. Faith in Christ comes by hearing the gospel, and the Spirit comes along with faith. So the Spirit's work is not a reward based on a person's own spiritual achievement. It is a gift to those who believe in Christ's achievement. The Holy Spirit is not something we gain. It is something we are given, just like our faith. Paul wanted to settle the matter for the Galatians by asking them, one really one question he wants we want to grant him this that the spirit comes by faith alone not by any works of the law it comes by faith alone and this has profound implications for us if the holy spirit has come by faith alone it means that the christian life finishes exactly the way it starts the way into the christian life the front door right is also the way on in the Christian life, the foyer, the living room, the family room, the kitchen, the bedrooms, the bathrooms. We can't be perfected by the works of our own or our own efforts. After beginning with the Spirit, we must not then depend upon our human efforts to be right with God. We do not leave the Spirit to in the, at the front door. The Spirit comes in with us as we live by faith alone, empowered by Him. We cannot complete our salvation by human effort or following the law. God completes what he has begun, and this is through the Holy Spirit, applying the work of Christ in our lives by faith, that union we have with Christ. Now, let me say a few words about justification and sanctification. 
At first glance, when we read these verses, it seems to be about sanctification, the process by which Christians become more like Christ. We may think that sanctification as everything that comes after our justification. It might be something like this. I was justified by faith when I came to Christ, when I first came to Christ. Now I am justified by faith. I must move to my sanctification. Yes, sanctification follows justification. But we never, listen, we never let go of our, our, of our justification. We never let go of our justification. Uncle, uncle, right? Yeah. No, we will never stand before God on the basis of our own righteousness. We only stand before God on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Once and forever, we are justified before God by the righteousness we receive by faith. To be certain, growing in Christ's likeness throughout our lives. But we cannot use our obedience, as imperfect as it is, to establish our righteousness before God. We cannot base our justification on our, on our sanctification. We cannot base our justification on our sanctification. From start to finish, the whole Christian life is by grace alone through faith alone. A new life in Christ starts with faith, continues by faith, and will be completed by faith. The role of the Holy Spirit then is to make that a reality for us each day as we depend upon him to live out our faith journey, to live out this union we now have with Christ. But not only is it good news that we have the Spirit by faith alone, we also, we also in this justification by faith and living by faith alone, it's just not a New Testament idea. It's just not a New Testament truth. It has its roots in the Old Testament with one of the heroes of our faith, Abraham. Our just living by faith alone is tied to the past. Look at verses 6 and 9. Paul, as he's sharing these, this with the Galatian church, does something very clever here. He brings one of the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament as an example of one who is justified by faith alone. Paul counters the claims of the Judaizers who say, yeah, it's cool that you have faith in Christ, but now to remain acceptable to God, you must continue to live as a Jew. You must continue to follow the law. You see, Paul brings Abraham as an example for his position of justification by faith alone. Paul brings to mind to the bewitched Galatians that the Judaizers have it all wrong. Abraham, one of our fathers of the faith believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Hey Galatians, Abraham would agree with me, Paul reminds. This is where the text it comes from, Genesis 15 verses 1 to 6, I'm going to read. It said, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your, I'm your shield, your reward will be very great. But Abram said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I I continue childless, and the heir of my house of Elzazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son will be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven. Number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, You shall so shall your offspring be. And what does it say in verse 6? It says, he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is in the Old Testament, the first book of the Bible. He believed the Lord and it counted to him as righteousness. Paul uses a Greek word here that means declared or accounted. It was like a usual, it was usually an accounting term that meant that money was being received and counted as payment towards some end. Money was received in your bank account. This Friday, we are, are, we are closing our home, and there's going to be tons of money being deposited into our bank accounts. So what does it mean here? Meaningly, when Abraham believed, God transfer, transferred his righteousness into Abraham's account. This does not mean that Abraham was actually righteous, but only was declared righteous. God is treating Abraham as if he were living a righteous life. Remember, this came before the command to circumcise your children, right? There was no law about circumcising your children at this point. He, he received the righteousness of Christ, not by circumcision, but by faith. He was considered to be in a right standing for God. 
Doesn't that sound familiar, what Paul is trying to say, right? The proper theological term is God imputed righteousness to Abraham. God alone has the legal right to state whether a person is righteous or, or a person is unrighteous. In this case, God considered Abraham righteous through, not works, but through faith alone. When God credits righteousness to us, he treats us as actually righteous and free from condemnation and are therefore pleasing to God to live and there, and we are thus justified. Now, there's a difference with most religions, Keller points out. Most other religious traditions communicate that either we live righteously and therefore pleasing to God, or we live unrighteously, but therefore alienated from God. But Paul and Abraham are showing that it is possible to be loved and accepted by God while we ourselves sinful and imperfect. Martin Luther uses this phrase, famous phrase, simultaneously righteous and sinful. At the same time, righteous and sinful. See, Christian justified status is not given to us because we've gotten our lives into a certain level of obedience. We don't clean up our acts in order to earn credit righteousness. Rather, we receive it while we are a sinner like Abraham, like Paul. And we see in verse 7, something amazing happens. As we receive it by faith, we are part of the family of God, right? It says, know them that is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Those who believe are children of Abraham. Paul is saying not a physical descent, not that you that, that matters, not that you become Jewish that matters, but a spiritual descent having the same faith. So what does it mean being of faith? Well, Keller points out two aspects of this. Saving faith is believing the gospel promise. He goes on to say to believe, believing in God is not saving faith for Satan and demons believe in God. Rather, Abraham believed and trusted what God actually said in his promise to save. Keller says this, you can't believe God without believing in God. But you can believe in God without believing God. Saving faith is different from, gen um, from general faith in the existence of God, or even the doctrines and teachings of the Bible in general. Saving faith is trusting in the saving gospel promises of God, which we see fulfilled in Christ. But he also says that Abraham shows us that saving faith is God's is faith in God's provision, and not our performance. That saving faith is Faith in God's provision, not our performance. Now think about it with me. At this point, Abraham was childless. He was with a barren wife. They could not have children. Yet God takes him out, and he promises that his offspring will be as many as the stars. As, see, Abraham, as you see the stars, you're going to have this many offsprings, endless. So Keller states says God would come down into history and do a mighty deed that did not depend on human ability at all. The promise of an heir depended wholly on God, not on Abraham at all. Abraham had to believe that God would do it. And in Genesis 15, verse six, Abraham did believe in that saving gospel promise. You see, those we see in verses eight and nine are then those who believe in the gospel promise are saved the same way. That includes Gentiles and Jews, all people from all different cultures and eth ethnic groups. It says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 8 reminds us of God's first promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. It says this, and I will make you a great nation, and you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. What's so beautiful about this is all of Scripture is tied together. What God revealed in Genesis is finding fulfillment now in the gospel going to the Gentiles. I love what B.B. Warfield, a Princeton theologian in the 20th century, supports. He says this, God and Scriptures are brought into such a conjunction as to show that in point of directness of authority, no distinction was made between them. The Bible is God's written word. Scriptures are, scripture are alive as a result. It has the power to proclaim because God speaks truth as it is living. 
and powerful voice. Thus, God speaks with one mind and one message. And that one message is justification by faith alone. Uncle, uncle, right? It's okay. I hear it. I hear it. God's plan of salvation, the covenant of grace, runs from Adam to Abraham right through Jesus Christ. It says, the scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Verse 8 testifies. What God said to Abraham was nothing less than the proclamation of the gospel. It was what God said to Adam and Eve when they first sinned and promised a redeemer. See, ultimately, the good news of the Old Testament is the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news about forgiving sins and granting eternal life. They are the very things Abraham believed. He did not know the name of Jesus, but he trusted him nonetheless. He believed God would forgive his sins and grant him eternal life. He had faith, in, in other words, he, in both the atonement and the resurrection. Galatians, don't be bewitched by these Judaizers. The faith you have in the gospel is the same faith that Abraham had in the gospel. And as Abraham was declared righteous by faith, we are declared righteous by faith. And working the law doesn't add a darn thing to your salvation, as it didn't earn, didn't, it didn't earn a darn thing with Abraham's salvation. It is all of God sending his son to die for our sins and to rise us to live again so that we may be declared acceptable and in a right equal standing with before God. What you want to know about living by faith that's empowered by the Spirit is tied to the past. It's not something new idea. It's something that God had designed from the get-go. But what else do we, does Paul want us to know? What amazing thing does Paul, else does Paul want us to know in this section? It's talking about this beautiful truth that the curse of the law has been removed. Look at verses 10 through 14. These five verses reveal to us the problem of the law and the beauty of the gospel expressed specifically in the cross. The problem of the law, it demands perfection. Friends, if you can't keep it, if you can't keep it perfectly, you are cursed and I am cursed. God requires nothing less than a total obedience to the entire law. God's perfect law is for everyone. For the Jew and to the Gentile, to every type of nation and cultures. The punishment for failing to keep God's perfect standard is God's righteous curse. Every lawbreaker is subject to divine condemnation. Listen to what the Westminster Confession of Faith, question and answer 84 says. Who, what does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life, that which is to come. That means we ourselves are under the curse, for we are lawbreakers. Westminster Confession number 82 says this, no mere man since the fall is able in this life to keep the law perfectly, the commandments of God, but does daily break it, break them in thought, word, and deed. Or Paul says that in his letter to Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Friends, if this is true, that everyone without exception is condemned by the curse of the law, then why try to base your salvation on keeping the law? And that is Paul's point. Everyone who depends on the law is under a curse because the law curses everyone who breaks it, which includes you and me. Ironically, the Judaizers by advocating obedience to the law, was not escaping God's curse, but they were incurring it. So Paul again so eloquently reminds us that the curse of our imperfect, imperfect obedience to the law has been removed. Oh, how are oh, the beauty of the cross? Look at verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, curse is anyone who's hung on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Through the cross, we are redeemed. The redemption here comes from the marketplace. It refers to the payment of a price. In Paul's time, the word redeemed was most often used as a, in the slave market, where it's referred to the purchase price of a slave. So a friend or a relative would buy back a slave from the captivity and set him free. The slave would be liberated through the payment of a ransom. 
As we know, we owe a huge debt due to our sin. And we are not able to pay that debt off because we cannot keep the law perfectly. So when the New Testament speaks of redemption of sinners, it emphasizes an extremely costly price of redemption. In fact, Jesus himself says in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In order for God to pay the priceless ransom of um, due to our sin of slavery, Jesus had to endure God's wrathful curse. Paul quotes in this passage, Deuteronomy 1, 21, 23. Here it says, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. When a person was executed in the Old Testament, it was usually by stoning. Then his body, after he's dead, then his body was hung on a tree as a symbol of divine rejection. He hung as a sign of this curse. So Paul connects the reference to Christ, whose execution was on a cross tree, to show that he experienced the curse, listen, of divine rejection. Jesus suffered the curse of divine rejection. At the cross, God freed us, redeemed us from the curse of the law by taking it in taking it for us. He was our substitute. He received the curse we earned in verse 13 so that we might receive the blessing he earned in verse 14. Our sins and, cur our sins and curse are given and imputed to him. His righteousness, his blessing, his spirit is imputed to us. Remember the book illustration I used a few weeks ago where Jesus took our sin and we were given his righteousness and all of that, what that means. Jesus became a curse for us, removed the curse we deserve due to our rebellion and sin. Jesus was treated, listen, as if he was a sinner, that he was treated liable for all the wickedness and sin that we are liable for. He literally became sin so that you can understand when he was on the cross and he exclaimed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luther says this, so as long as sin and death and the curse remain in us, it damns us, death kills us, and the curse curses us. But when these things were transferred to Christ, listen, what is ours becomes his, and what is his becomes ours. Oh, what beautiful love is this, that God would send his one and only son to remove the curse we so rightly, rightfully deserve to receive the redemption and freedom from our slavery of sin that we didn't deserve or, or earn. Listen to these beautiful words. I'll end here from the American folk hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? Listen as I read, dwell on it, rest in it, bask in it. Oh, what wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul, oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Let's pray. Father, you did this because of all of grace. We receive it all by faith alone because of Christ who's done this amazing work of taking the curse that the law demanded of us, placing it on him, so that we can be free to live by faith alone as we are empowered by the Spirit to live out this faith from the beginning to the end. Oh God, thank you for that sweet grace. Thank you for the Spirit. Thank you that our faith is consistent from the old to the new. Thank you that you're, you have removed the curse so that we can stand right and holy before you. Oh God, what a gracious, loving, amazing God that you would send your beloved Son to take that dreaded curse for us. Oh, may that encourage us. May that motivate us. May that move us then to live in this union, to reflect the beauty of Christ to those that were in relationships, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us spend some time praying for the things of this world, and then we'll end our time in the Lord's Prayer. Father, I do want to lift up those who have served our country, who've lost their lives for serving for the freedom of this country. But we know that many have lost their lives to protect those freedoms. So we remember them this, this, this day. But we also pray for current day families who've lost their loved ones due, 
to serving this country. We pray for your mercy and grace to be upon those families, to that widowed wife, to those parents that are left without a child. Lord, may your mercy and grace be upon them this day as we do, as we remember those fallen soldiers, men and women who served this country faithfully and lost their lives as a result. Father, we do thank you and rejoice in the, the new birth of Jessica and Puya. We thank you for this new child. We pray, thank you for that delivery. We pray you would bless them in their new role as parents. Give them grace and mercy. Lord, we pray for others who heard some hard news this week. We pray, God, for your grace and mercy to be upon those families. We pray for healing specifically for this one particular family. May you nurture them, strengthen them, give them grace, give them encouragement. Lord, we continue to pray for this, our government leaders, our state leader, our local leaders, our national leaders. Give them grace and mercy. Give them wisdom, insight as they lead our country. Help them to be influenced by godly men and women who will speak truth to help us do the right thing in this time of need. We pray for those who are struggling with the, with COVID. Lord, we pray your mercy and grace bring healing to them. Be with those families who have lost loved ones as a result. May your mercy, may you be their good shepherd, care for their souls, minister to them, we pray. Oh, Lord, may, your, may you end this soon, Lord, we pray. Bring healing to this disease. Find a cure. Be with the scientists as they do their work. Help them, give them insight that will help us as we move forward. Pray for those who have lost job as a result. Care for them, minister to them, we pray. And now, Lord, as we come together, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, let us be encouraged by what we're to be about. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive the, our, our debts. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may you be blessed by this benediction from our very own Jamie Swope, our Director of Children, Children and Family Ministry and our now commissioned lay pastor. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for your message out of Galatians. I'm so excited to be your commissioned lay pastor now and ordained elder, Nielsville Church family. I appreciate all of you so much. Thank you for the role that you played in being an encouragement in my life. Uh, the CLP process has been incredible. I've grown so much through it, and I have a lot of people in our church to thank. So specifically, just want to call out Michelle Kelly as my mentor. You've been amazing. Thank you so much for all the time you poured into me. You're so faithful and you're such a good leader and you love the Lord so much. So I've learned a lot from you. Pastor Jeff, thank you for putting up with me and uh, for when you first met me, just for uh, when I was in that low point of being in a real tired place in ministry where I could have quit, you told me not to, gave me strong advice to hang in there and to fix my eyes in Jesus, knowing that by persevering through some of those trials that we would see the Lord do a good work in our church and that he would grow me through that too. And all of that has been true. So thank you for being a good example of a good shepherd, too, and a good leader. Kevin Swope, I love you. I appreciate your support uh, all along my life. You've really been my partner for so long. You were my friend as a 12-year-old when I met you, and, and I was a baby Christian. And we've had opportunities to serve the Lord together then. And you've just always encouraged the gifts that you saw in me. And also listen to the Lord with me. We've made some big steps together, moving all across the country and supporting each other through job changes and all sorts of things. So I love you, honey, and I thank you for the way you're supporting me in this calling. Kids, I love you. Charlotte, Jason, Madeline, <laughs> you are part of a team with, with Daddy and me to serve the Lord. You are part of this. So I share this with you. And church family, Again, I, I can't do this without you. I need your prayers. I need your support. I am a sinner, and so I need grace. I need accountability, and I appreciate your prayers for the Holy Spirit to continue to work in me. So I get to give the benediction as my first act as a commissioned lay pastor. So I'm going to share my life verse, one of them from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Nielsville Church. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, 
looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May we run that race well together toward Jesus. Have a blessed Sunday.